to thank the organizers. They have done a great job here. And I was very impressed by the crowds. There are so many people, and uh, I met a lot of people too. And first, also, I want to share one experience I had last night, a very unique experience. Last night, Joanna took us to eat durian. That's the first time ever, actually, I eat durian. I loved it. It's great. Especially while you are eating durian and you drink coconut juice with it. That's the best, actually. I want to understand our audience a little bit more. Show me your hands if you, you have invested stocks in stocks for more than five years. Raise your hands. Okay. And show me your hands if you have invested in stock market for more than 10 years. 10 years. Not that many. About 20 years. Oh, some? Yeah, I'm not surprised because most of, most of you probably are not old enough to have 20 years of experience. 20 years ago, a little bit over 20 years ago, I went to the United States. I went to Texas. As I was introduced, I already have a physics degree, a PhD in physics degree. I already have a, I have a PhD in physics. I was studying lasers, optics, I was a scientist. But in 1998, if you go to the United States in 1998, you will see that everything is so hot. Everything related to technology is so hot. If you're old enough, you'll remember that the year 2000 was uh, the peak of the technology bubble. And in 1998, was the Everything was on the way to the technology bubble. If you go to meetings, conference, meet friends, go to church, what do people talk about? Stocks. Everyone was talking about stocks, talking about IPOs, talking about how much money they have made in the stock market. One young student from China, he went to the US to study, but he bought $10,000 stocks in very short term, very short time, it turned into $100,000. The stock market was so hot. I saw that, oh, it looks like making money in stock market is, was easy. I want to buy stocks too. But I knew nothing about stocks in 1998. So I, I decided to buy stocks. I have a PhD in physics, in lasers, optics. So when I buy stocks, what kind of stocks do I buy? <laughs> I buy the companies that produce optics and lasers. <laughs> of course, I thought that I know these kind of things, right? I understand how it works. Later on, I had uh, 32 patents in this field. 32 US patents in lasers and optics, fiber, uh, fiber optics. So I know very well about it. And uh, after I bought, the stock actually went up quickly, very quickly. Then things doesn't work that way anymore. And there was 911, 9-11 terrorist attack in the US. That's 2001, September 11th. And uh, then the bubble burst. I lost all my money, actually, in the fiber optic companies I bought, almost all of them. I was very lucky. In a way, I was very lucky that I didn't have much money at that time. <laughs> it's, it's one of the very few times in your life that you feel you're lucky because you don't have money. And then I start to think. I was shocked. I start to think. I said, something is wrong. I was not doing it in the right way. Then I got to read, 
read Peter Lynch and read Warren Buffett. I read all the shareholder letters of Warren Buffett from 1950s to today multiple times. It changed my life. It did change my life. I realized that when I invest in stocks, invest in those fiber optic companies, I was actually investing in a bubble. And this kind of bubble happened many times in history. And what I experienced was actually nothing new. It happened many, many times in history. So today I want to share my experience how to invest like a guru, how to invest in the right way, how to invest, how to generate higher returns at lower risk over long term. I talk about bubble. Of course, I think a lot of you heard about this before, maybe you probably know. Do you know this flower? What kind of flower is it? Tulip, yes. And in about 19, uh, sorry, in about the 1640s, in Netherlands, there was a tulip bubble. At initial, at, at the beginning, tulip was just, uh, it was introduced to Europe, and it was popular among professional growers. Then the price started to increase. And the regular people noticed it too. And then the price continued to go, go up, go up more quickly. And people found that you just bought the onion, the root of tulip, it's like an onion. And you, you buy it in the morning, you sell in the afternoon, you make money. And the price goes up very quickly. At the peak, at the peak, the price of a tulip, tulip onion root was about three times of the annual salary of a skilled worker at that time. So one root of tulip equals the salary of a skilled worker many years, many years of their salary. So it's that expensive. Then the bubble burst, the price went down quickly, and everyone lost money. That's, that's the first bubble ever recorded in history. Do you know who this young, handsome man is? Anyone know? Newton. Newton. Yes, someone's there said it's Newton. Remember what uh, my PhD was? Physics, right? And who Newton is? Newton is the greatest physicist ever to me. Greatest, the greatest ever physicist ever existed in history. And the Newton, there was a company called South Sea, South sea Company. This company, they got an agreement with British government. The company assumed the debt of British government. But in return, they get the, the exclusive, exclusive rights to trade on South Sea water. That's why the company is called South Sea Company. And uh, people love the monopoly of the company, so start to buy the stocks. Newton bought as well. Newton, Newton bought at a, lo a lower price initially. Then the price of stock quickly tripled. And he sold it. So he made he tripled his money. But then the price continued to go up. And his friends made more money. Newton started to regret. So after the stock price tripled again, Newton put all of his money in. He lost twenty thousand pounds. That's about all of his money at that time. That happened about 300 years ago. So Newton later on wrote that, uh, I can calculate the movement of stars, but I cannot calculate the madness of man. When I read about Newton, Newton lost money in stock market too. I felt much better. <laughs> 
because he's much he's a much better physicist than I was. <laughs> okay, then the the stock market bubble I experienced. Oh, sorry. Experience actually the peak in about year 2000. That's that was a tech bubble, in year 2000. You can see it's a it's a very big bubble, and uh, after it burst, the Nasdaq lost about 80 percent. I think more than 80 percent. That's an index lost more than 80 percent, and it recovered. It, it didn't recover until at least uh, I think 14 years later. NASDAQ index. Then, of course, it went up even more. And uh, recently, it went down some. And in the middle of the, the peak there, it's a bubble I experienced. And historically, there are quite a few bubbles. The Tulip Mania I mentioned there, South Sea Company, the Railroad Mania in the United States, eight, 1840s. And the stock market, uh, stock market bubble before the Great Depression in the United States in 1920s. And Japan's real estate bubble. Everyone probably heard something about that too. Of course, the dot, dot com bubble I experienced. And the housing bubble in 2007, 2006, 2007 in the US. Financial, that caused the financial crisis. And uh, recently, of course, last year, last few years, several years, there were bitcoins. To me, it's a bubble. It burst it last year. So, what's the next? Maybe real estate in Beijing? I don't know. So, during bubble times, most people, lots of people, most people become irrational. In year, two, uh, in year 1999, actually in 1998, Warren Buffett was considered out of touch. People said, uh, Warren Buffett, you're an old-time investor, and you don't know, you don't understand technology. That's why you don't invest in technology, and you're out of date. And another great investor called Donald Yakman, I know him very well personally, he built a mutual fund called the Yakman Fund, his, his name, under his name, Yakman Fund. And he was a great investor. He grew his asset to about a billion dollars. But then, during the technology bubble, dot-com bubble, he does not invest in dot-com companies because he's a bad investor. So what happened to him? His fund performance went down. And what happened to his fund? He had a billion dollars in his fund, but people were withdrawing the money. By 1998, his fund had only $80 million. So 92% of the money was withdrawn because he does not invest in technology stocks. Of course, then the bubble burst. People realized that he's actually a great investor. <laughs> too late, and uh, two years ago when I asked him how much money he was managing, he said 24 billion now. So he's managing 24 billion. Mark Twain said that history does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. So actually this kind of pattern repeats all the time. They are slightly different in different ways every time, but they are actually very similar. After I, I learned all of this, I, I read Warren Buffett's shareholder letters, and I was following all the great investors like Donald Yakman and others in my spare time. In 2004, I saw that why don't I share this online? Why don't I share this with others? So I started Guru Focus in 2004. The idea is just, uh, I think lots of speakers mentioned it or repeated multiple times. So, because when you invest, there are so many stocks, so many companies to choose from. 
Why don't I why don't I choose from the portfolios of some great investors? And in this way I can reduce my risk. That's my that was my original thinking. So that's why it's, it's, I said, if I have been seeing further, it's, be, uh, it's by standing on the shoulders of the giant. That's a famous quote by Newton. And today we are not just uh, tracking gurus, where we actually provide uh, all the fundamental data for worldwide companies, for about more than 80,000 companies. We cover almost every company traded in every market. We provide financial data, we provide uh, valuation, data and the research tools for these companies. We had uh, more than 20,000 investor subscribers from more than 100 com uh, countries, actually. And every year we also host a conference, it's called Guru Fox Value Conference uh, in Omaha. The day before Berkshire Hathaway meeting in, in Omaha. And I will invest uh, some of the best investors to come to our conference, to speak, to share their experience and lessons. So what is value investing? The concept of value investing is actually very simple. Value investing is just you compare the price and value. For every company, you try to figure out the value. A price, of course, you know it all the time. Then you compare the price and, and value. You hope that the price is much lower than the value, and that's called margin of safety. And if the price is much lower than value, over time, maybe the price will go up and they reach where the value is. It sounds very simple. It's, it, it is very simple, the concept. Charlie Munger even said that all investing is, is value investing. So following this strategy, we did something, we did calculation of all the companies that's traded in the market in 2000, I think we did this in 2008. So we found that, oh, there are so many companies that traded so much below the price, the value. And there's such a big margin of safety there. We bought all of them, I think about 20 something of them. In, in December of 2008, then we hold them for until 2011, July of 2011, and they, they did great. They returned about 257% in these three something years, and over the same period, the S&P S &P 500 only returned 40 something percent. So. You, you buy those companies at much deep price, low price, deeply discounted to their value, and they did really good, did really well. Then we continue to do it in 2011. 2011, we did the same thing. Then because the stock market had went up, have, had gone up quite a bit, so we don't find as many companies that traded at a deep discount anymore. They're a shorter, much shorter list. So we bought them again. We hold them, then we found that we're not making money. We actually, in some years, we lose money. We underperform the market quite a bit. So buying underpriced company does not always work. So it seems like the value investing is not working. Why here? Why? Value investing is not working. Looks like we bought them at deep discount. Why? This actually makes investing not, not that simple. The reason is because of the value of a company is never constant. When we, in 2011, when we bought those deeply discounted companies, if we look at the quality of these companies, they're actually very poor. And all the higher quality companies 
are not treated at discount anymore. So if you want to force yourself to just buy these deeply discounted companies, basically what you bought are very low quantities, very low quality companies. So a basket of garbage basically bought. And uh, the value of these companies actually going down over time. So even price didn't go up, but the value is going down. So what happens? You lose money. The price follows value, going down also. So with this lesson, I saw that why don't we buy the company that has a value going up? Why do I want to buy the company that has decline value? Why don't I buy the company that can grow their values? So this is called the growth of value. The value of a company is never constant. It doesn't stay the same over time. It can change depending on the operation of the companies. And if we buy the company that can grow their value over time, we have a much better chance of making money. Maybe initially our margin safety is not that high, but the, the value of the company is going up. That broadens our margin of safety. And the, another good thing of, but, uh, of this is that you can hold the company a longer time because the, the value is always going up, and you can hold it as long as the value is going up and you still have enough margin of safety. So I call this high-quality investing. So we don't buy low-quality companies. We buy the companies that can grow their value over time. They're good companies. So this style of investing was actually myself was deep, deeply influenced by a few investors. One is Peter Lynch. I think uh, probably all of you heard about Peter Lynch before. Peter Lynch said that uh, there are several things that's so important in investing. One is, first of all, is earnings, earnings, earnings. I want to ask you, why do business people set up companies? For what purpose? To make money. That's very simple. All the entrepreneurs, not, uh, not, some maybe not, but uh, most of business people, entrepreneurs, they start companies to make money. So profit is far more the most important thing for a company. You need to make money. Earnings, earnings, earnings. That's some First thing you, look, you should look at when you look at a company. If does a company have earnings, can, it, can the company make money all the time, no matter the economy is bad or good? Now, how does it make money? It make, it's making money today. Can it still make money in the next five years? And second lesson I learned was a company that does not have debt cannot go bankrupt. I'm not sure about Malaysia or Singapore. In the United States, a lot of people file personal bankruptcies. Why? Because they have too much debt. They cannot pay off their debt, they cannot pay their debt. So they file bankruptcy. They own too much money. That same thing with a company. If a company does not have debt, it will not go bankrupt. So this is actually, this part talking about the balance sheet of the company. The first sentence talking about the income statement part of the company. The second is the balance sheet of the part of the company. And then Peter Lynch said, go for a business that any idiot can run. Why? Because he said that sooner or later, an idiot will run. So 
So basically, you want to buy a company that simple, that's easy to understand, that even average people can operate it with some experience, because you cannot put too much expectations on management. They are humans. Of course, the person that influenced me the most is Warren Buffett. There's this famous quote, it says, it's far better to buy a wonderful company at fair prices than a fair company at wonderful prices. So basically he's talking about, you want to buy high quality companies at a reasonable price. You don't want to buy low quality companies at deep discounted price. High quality companies, with high quality companies, time is your friend because over time, these companies will grow their value. And the second quarter of Warren Buffett here I want to share is, it's crazy to put money in your 20th choice rather than your first choice. So you don't want to be too diversified because when you're too diversified, you're not familiar with the companies anymore. You have some good ideas, some good companies you're familiar with, you have confidence in. Then you want to put more money in it, and you don't, have, you don't want to own too many stocks. Peter Lynch quote, I think, I think during the lunch queuing session, uh, Someone shared it. He said that you don't want to own too many stocks. You don't, you, you don't want to own more stocks than the number of children can handle, something like that. So you don't, you, don't have, you don't want to have too many children than you can handle. Don't have too many children. So you don't want to own too many stocks. You don't want to, to be too diversified. You want to put money in your best ideas. And uh, the third quote of Warren Buffett says, our holding time is forever. Because you are buying good companies that can grow value, you want to grow with the company for a long time. And especially, you have so much confidence in the company. So you don't want to sell, you want to hold it, you want to hold it. You want to hold it for a long time. You want to hold it forever. That's some three things I learned from Warren Buffett. And uh, another investor I want to share, I mentioned him before, Donald Yakman. Donald Yakman. Donald Yakman said that you want to buy companies that are not cyclical. So basically, he's saying that you want to buy companies that are consistent with their performance. Donald Yakman is not as famous as Peter Lynch or as Warren Buffett, but he's a great investor. I mentioned him before. And during, during one of our conferences, he was a keynote speaker for our conference, he shared one story of his. He has six children. One of them called Steve. Steve is now managing his, his fund, Yakman fund. And during this, uh, earlier years, Steve said that this company, General Motors, looks like a very good bargain, and I think we can do very well in it. And Donald Yakman said, Steve, I think you're right. I think we, you may make money in General Motors, but I don't invest in those kind of companies. Because car companies, auto companies, they're very cyclical. When the economy is good, people buy cars, buy lots of cars. When the economy is bad, people stop buying cars. So they're cyclical. They're not consistent like that. They're cyclical. And when it's cyclical during a the downturn, 
They can do very poorly. The company can go bankrupt. So he said that you may make money in it, but I don't invest in those kind of companies. So I only invest in companies that uh, can grow their business consistently. I don't invest in cyclical companies. That's what the story that Donald Yakman shared with me. Of course, he pay attention to the management. He wants to check what the management is doing with the money that the company made. Are they reinvest, uh, paying dividends, or buying back shares, or doing acquisitions? Or the management maybe paying themselves a lot of salary? So he study, he do study management. And the, the third thing he, he said that had a very big impact on me was set a hurdle rate. So basically you set a, a barrier for the expected return you want to have for this company, for all your companies. So maybe you're, you hope that uh, the company, any company you invest, can return at least 10% a year. But if you cannot find this kind of companies, you don't lower your standard. You just don't buy the stocks. So set a hurdle rate and stay with it. That's why sometimes you will see he, his fund has very high cash positions, and sometimes when the market is, is low, and he have very low cash positions. So with all these lessons, I did some study of the companies we, that, are, that were in our database. I focused on US market. And if, if you look at all these companies, we look at the last 10 years of earnings, because I mentioned that earnings, 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 that's the most important thing. So we look at their earnings. You know, over the last 10 years, some companies will be profitable every year. And some company will lose money maybe in one year, in two years, in three years. And uh, then we look at their stock performances. Assuming that we hold this company, we bought the stocks 10 years ago, and we hold them for 10 years, and we look at 10 years later. We found that uh, for the companies that have been profitable, making money every year, for every year of these 10 years, the chance of losing money with the stocks is very low. Your study is showing about six, seven percent, about seven percent. So when, if the company makes money every year over the last 10 years, and you bought their stock 10 years, 10 years ago, and you hold it until today, the chance of you losing money on the stocks is up only about 7%. But if the company had uh, lost money in three years, so they were only profitable in the seven years of the last 10 years. They were losing money in three years. You do the same thing. You bought a stock 10 years ago, you hold it until today the chance of losing money with the stock is much higher. It will reach about 30%. So what is this telling us? It's earnings of earnings, earnings. You want to buy the company that never lost money. If you buy a company that never lost money, the chance of losing money, you losing money in the stocks, over long term is much smaller. That's earnings, earnings, earnings. And then we look at the average return of the companies we researched. For the companies that never lost money over the last 10 years, the stock performance is much better, much higher than the companies that lost. Here, for instance, if they had three years lost money over the last 10 years, the stock almost returned nothing. Even you bought 10 years ago and you hold it until today, the average return is nothing. 
If a company lost money in five years of the last 10 years, you bought their stock hold for 10 years. You find that 10 years later, many of those companies don't exist anymore. They went bankrupt. So that's so important to pay attention to the earnings, earnings, earnings. When I studied this, I looked at the fiber optics companies I bought in 1998. They never made money. <laughs> they never had any profit. So that's why I lost money. Then you want to buy good companies. The second choice, second point. First point is you must have earnings, consistent earnings with the company. That's the first important thing. You need to, most important thing you should pay attention to. Second is what? It's called return on invested capital. It's a, it's a little bit, a little bit involving, a little bit complex. So what is return on invested capital? Don't think too complex about it. It's actually just mirroring how easy that the company can make money. Some, company, some companies can make money relatively easily. Some are harder. I will give you some examples here. Everyone knows about Nike, right? The brand, your sport brand, Nike. You wear the shoes, you, you wear the sports shorts or clothes. Nike company. The founder of Nike, his name is Phil Knight. In 2017, he wrote a very good book, biography of his, his, himself, called Shoe Dog. Shoe Dog. This book was recommended by Bill Gates. Actually, I read Bill Gates' review about the book, and I bought this book, and I love this book. And in the book review, Bill Gates wrote that Nike founder Phil Knight, he started Nike in the 1960s. And uh, within the first 20 years of Nike's life, almost every day, Nike was close to bankruptcy. Why? Because the company needs too much money to operate, to grow, and they always have to borrow. And it's very hard for Nike to make money. They always have to borrow. They were always on the brink of bankruptcy. But Bill Gates wrote that for himself, he started Microsoft, and he produces software. He de developed software that no matter how many copies he sells, the cost is the same. So during life of Microsoft, he never had the problem of borrowing money. He never needed to borrow money. And it's, Microsoft is just like a cash call, bring all the cash. So compare with Nike with Microsoft, which one make, made money easily, relatively easily? Of course, Microsoft. So you want to buy the companies that can make money relatively easily. Not too hard. So usually this, com this kind of company have high return on invested capital. Another example I want to share here a story. A person called Donald Keel. He was a chief operating officer of Coca-Cola. And he was a neighbor of Warren Buffett. They lived on the same street. He was much older than Warren Buffett. When Warren Buffett was starting out in his 20s, 21, he went to Donald Kill. He said that, Donald, do you want to, I'm starting an investment partnership. Do you want to put $10,000 in? If Warren Buffett was asking you, do you want to put money in? 
<laughs> of course, well, everyone I would. But Donald Kiel yeah. said no. He didn't. He said this Warren guy, he's 21, but he looks like 16. How can I trust a guy like him? So he said no. And later on, he got interviewed by CNBC. CNBC was asking him, do you regret you didn't put money in Warren Buffett's investment partnership? He said, yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so if you had invested that $10,000 in the 1950s, how much it was worth by now, by today? It would be 400 million. 400 million. And this interview was about 10 years ago. So by today, it would be 4 billion. But he didn't do that investment. So I here I share this story not about uh, return on investment capital, but I want to share his story about investment capital. I mentioned that he was the chief operating officer of Coca-Cola. What does Coca-Cola do? Coca-Cola basically just fill sugar water into bottle and sell it. But Coca-Cola didn't do that all the time. At one time, Coca-Cola had a wine business. Coca-Cola was making wines also. When they have parties, when they have meetings, conferences, they would put a Coca-Cola wine on it. It looks so good, make a company look so good, they have their own wine. But then Donald Keel realized that. He, he looked at the return invest capital of this one part of the business of Coca-Cola. He found that, wow, it's so hard to make wines. You first plant the grape trees there, and you tender it, you water it, you fertilize it. After three, four years, it starts to grow grapes. You pick the grapes out, up, pick them, then you put them in a big bucket and grow, uh, brew them, instill them, and get the juice. Then you fill all the juice into a stainless steel barrel and let it to do chemical reactions for several years. Then you pour it into a wood barrel to get the taste of wood. After some years, you pour it again into bottles. Every time when you pour it, you lost about 10%. And eventually it's in a bottle now. You ship it to, a, to Walmart. You found that, wow, there are at least 100 kinds of wines there. And your wine is among them. You would never know when someone will buy that bottle of wine. So the return on invest capital for wine business of Coca-Cola was zero. Then Donald Keel saw that. Why don't, I just, why don't we just stay in the business of selling sugar water? Why do we want to get into this wine business? Why don't we just fill the sugar water in the morning and sell it in the afternoon already? So Coca-Cola sold that wine business and focused on their main business, selling sugar water. I never drink it. So compare this wine business and uh, Coca-Cola's main business. Which one is easier in making money? Of course, it's Coca-Cola part of business, right? And uh, that part has much higher return on invested capital. So re return on invested capital is just mirroring how easily this company makes money. And uh, if you look at the companies I studied, most companies have Return on invest capital about 6%, the peak there. And some will have more than 20%, but uh, much, much fewer companies. And then we look at the performance of stocks for this, all these companies. And uh, there's a very positive correlation between return on invest capital and the stock performance. The company with higher return on invest capital have higher returns with stocks. 
So now we, the second point I want to share is buy the companies that have higher return investor capital. That's the second point I want to share. First is what? Oh, you all forgot already? <laughs> earnings, earnings, earnings. Second is what? Return on invest capital. Third is growth. You want to buy the companies that can grow. Because when a company grow, it will become stronger, the value of shareholder value will become higher. This, these are United States companies. On average, they would grow, grow only about 5% a year. But some grow 20%. Some actually have declining growth. They're shrinking. And look at the stock performance. The ones that have been growing naturally have better stocks. So this is actually a third point I want to share. Is growth. So now we review. First is what? Earnings, earnings, earnings. The second is high return US capital. And third, growth. Wow, you guys are very good students. <laughs> okay, I want to share some companies that actually personally own Church and Dwight. I own this company, it's my largest holding. I don't, I don't mind share this. Look at the stock performance. And this vertical axis, it's an exponential, log, it's a log, log, logarithmic axis. So it's, it's an exponential growth. The stock has been like an exponential performance for many, many years, 50 years. What does the company make? Very simple stuff. Toothpaste, some tools, condoms. Look at the performance revenue the last 30 years. The blue bar, revenue has always been growing. And the yellow, or the green bar here is a profit. I never lost money in any year. If we lose money, it will go down the axis, right? So this coming definitely have earnings, 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 for long term. Doesn't matter the United States economy is in recession or not. And uh, this is a profit margin. The profit margin has been growing too. So not only the company makes money, and it makes more money on the same on the same amount of sales over time. That's a high quality company I love, and that's why their stock has been doing so well. Another company I want to share, Guizhou Maotai. I'm not sure it was shared before here in the summit, maybe many times. I want to share my own experience with it. <clears throat> That's the stock price. That's revenue and the earnings of multi. The company has been growing all the time and never lost money over the years. What's the difference between Coca-Cola and the multi? One is selling sugar water, the other is selling alcohol water. <laughs> I never drink Malta either. This is a profit margin. Operating margin, 60% of operating margin. I want to ask, ask you some questions here. Of course, we know companies like Apple, Google, they're great companies. Can anyone tell me what is the operating margin of Apple? No one knows. Hold a little bit. Okay, this is not has price to earnings ratio. In 
about 2014, the, pro, the prior, price to earnings ratio of Maltai went to about eight. That's when I bought Maltai. The, the price about uh, 110 dollars uh, US, no, renminbi a share. Why the price could go so low? The, the valuation can go so low. If you know a little bit about Chinese politics, in 2014, President Xi Jinping became the president, got in power, got into power. He, he, had, he started that very strong anti-corruption campaign. He closed all the luxurious restaurants, closed, and all the parties were stopped. And uh, people saw that the luxurious brand like Maltai will have, have trouble because no one will drink it anymore. But I look at the company, I found that the company never lost money. It had a margin of 60%, above 60%. That's nothing better than this. So I bought. But then some friend was telling me, oh, China is having anti-corruption campaign, and it will last us for quite some years. I told him that I'm a patient guy. I can wait until President Xi Jinping finishes his term limit. <laughs> Ten years. <laughs> I, can, I can wait, definitely. I'm not sure if this... Of course, I didn't realize that uh, China changed its constitution that President Xi Jinping doesn't have term limits anymore. <laughs> I didn't realize that. I definitely didn't, didn't expect that. But it doesn't matter to me. The stock price went up a lot, quickly, much better, much faster than I thought. I thought I need to wait for 10 years at least. But then actually, the stock price went up very quickly. It went to 800 in last year. It declined to 500 something this year. No, uh, actually, at the end of last year. I bought, I bought more. So that's a company I love. It always makes money. Very high return on invest capital and grow over time. So you need to think very long term here. The story, I share this story is you really need to think very long term. You should not avoid a company, a very good company, just because something's happening right now is bad for it. You really need to think very long term. Only when you think very long term, you will think differently from most of the people. And you will do better than them. Okay, I asked about the profit margin of, of Maltai, and how much is the profit margin of Coke? 20 something percent, 26 percent. And Maltai is 62 percent. What's the big difference? So which one is making money relatively easily? Maltai and Coke? Of course Maltai. So selling alcohol water is much better. <laughs> then, of course, I mentioned Apple and Google, those great companies world, in the world. What is their profit margin? Can any, anyone guess? What is the profit margin of Apple? How much? 25? Any others? You're right, actually. Here at least some very good companies, their profit margin compared with multi, multi is 62%. And Google, Apple, Coca-Cola, they all have about 25%. So nothing is better than multi. <laughs> really, really, nothing is better than multi.
Okay, that's actually the, the stats I want to share. And uh, I'm not sure about the time. Now I want to share some, some overall market valuation and the economy in the United States. Those, those I, I conclude to the part I talk about companies. Just remember three things. One is earnings, earnings, earnings. Second is return on invest capital. Third is what? Growth, yes. Very good. So here I want to talk about the general market. Because if you look at the stock market, especially in the United States, the stock market is a reflection of the economy. And look at this here, the, the green line here, it's the GDP of the United States. Now it's sitting about $20 trillion a year. $20 trillion, T is trillion here. And then I look at the total market cap so of all the companies that are traded in the United States. So all the stocks, you add their market cap together, and you can see that it's fluctuating, the blue line is fluctuating, fluctuating around the GDP. So the total market cap is a very good reflection of, of GDP, actually. It grows with the economy. And uh, I'll draw the ratio, a total market cap divided by GDP, there's a ratio here. And uh, you can see that around 100% in the last uh, 20 years or so, it, it fluctuates around 100%. So when the market is high in, during the tech bubble, the peak year 2000, went to about 150%. And then in 2001, 2002, the market crash went down to about 75%. Then the housing bubble in 2007, it went to about 110%. It crashed to about 150% only in year 2009. And these days, actually the October of last year, 2018, it went to close to 150% again. But uh, then there was a market correction, and it went down some. So now it's about 150, 125%. And we've, so it fluctuate, fluctuates around the a nominal a median value. From this, we can estimate how much the stock market will return over the next uh, eight years, 10 years. Assuming that the valuation will always come down to the median over time. So this, of course, there's some assumption. This is an estimate. And the red line is when we are very optimistic about the future. We have higher expected return. The green line here is we are very conservative or pessimistic about the future. The, re the return will be lower. The blue line is somewhere in the middle. So, and uh, look at the yellow line. Yellow line was an actual return, annualized return of eight years in the, history, in, in the past. You can see that the yellow line stays around the, the red line and the blue line over time. So it, it shows that this model actually works quite well. Like you can estimate the future return from the current market valuation. Maybe you don't follow it, but uh, if you go to gurufolks.com, there are one page, very long page, it's uh, dedicated to this valuation. You can go there and check it. So the genuine, and this little bit light blue line, it's a bond yield, it's a U.S. Treasury yield, two-year Treasury yield. In October of last year, 2018, a very optimistic estimate will give up a less than 2% return for a year for future. So in October last, last year, we calculated the future return of, of the stock market. We got that we found that the future return will be less than 2% a year, even if we were very optimistic. 
That 2% is lower than the U.S. Treasury yield in October of last year. So it was telling us that uh, the market future return will be so low. Why, don't, why do I want to take the risk? Why don't I just buy the U.S. Treasury? There's no risk with U.S. Treasury. So future market will be very, will have very poor returns. So this line tells us, and uh, then after October last, 2018, there was a market correction, and the return is currently better because of that correction. But still, even if we are very optimistic for the future, the U.S. market will have very poor returns in the next decade also. That's a conclusion I want to have here. So here are two summary, some summarize it. All investing is, is very investing. And second is the, the risk of buying a poorly operating company is the permanent loss of capital. So if you buy a poor company, your risk is you may lo lose uh, your money forever because company quality is so poor, the company can go bankrupt. You will, lose, you will lose all your money forever. A good company is a company that can grow, that have high return invest capital, that can make money consistently and all the time. And buy good companies only. That's a, that's a way to generate higher returns with reduced risk. By good companies only. The bad companies, the poor companies, they may look cheap, but they are value traps. They may be value traps. Okay, I, I wrote this book called Invest Like a Guru in 2016. I wrote this book to share what I learned. Actually, I want to share with my children. I have three children. I wrote this book for them, actually. They are too young to realize what's important in investing, so I wrote this book. Hopefully, one day they will read it. <laughs> and my daughter did read it last year. She's, six, she's 19 now. And I hope that by reading my book, they would stay in the right framework of investing. They would know that when you invest, you need to invest in good companies. They need to have a, they would know that uh, with a basic concept, what kind of companies are good companies. Of course, my book itself is not enough. Once you stay in the right framework, you still need to learn a lot of things. You need to read extensively, to study the business model, to know what your circle of competitiveness is. But my book will be a very good start po starting point for them. So I wrote this book to share what I learned with them. And I was very lucky that the book was translated in di into different languages. It was published in China, China last year by my the university I grew I graduated, Beijing Dashi Press, University Press. Last year it was published. And it was actually published in 2017 in Taiwan, but in traditional Chinese already. And uh, last year also in Japanese. And actually also in Korean. In in different languages. And uh, uh, some of you probably bought the book. I hope that you, you enjoy the book. If you want the English version, you can buy it on Amazon. If you want to, want to have a Chinese version, you can buy it on Jingdong. Jingdong. Okay, I was also very honored last year to, to invite, I was invited to contribute to a book called Warren Buffett Shareholder, the Warren Buffett Shareholder. Uh, there were about 40 some contributors to the book. I was, uh, I was one of them, it's here. Uh, 
And uh, there is actually Jack, Jack Bogle. Jack Bogle, I'm not sure if you heard of Jack Bogle. He was an inventor of Index Fund, the founder of Vanguard. He just died last week. He died last week. And uh, yeah, I was very honored to write this book, to contribute to this book as well. You can buy it on Amazon. At the end, I want to share what's important, the most important thing I learned. Actually, a quote from Charlie Munger. He said that those who keep learning will keep rising in life. So we just need to keep learning, learning, and learning. Again, that's a book. There's a QR code there. Thank you.